Um, and thanks everyone for sticking around. I know it's late on a Sunday, so um, it's nice to see you all here. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about this exhibition which we made at the V&A um, earlier in the year. Uh, it's about design, architecture, technologies, cities, medicine, space, uh, climate change, kind of a big exhibition about the whole world and everything in it. And really the question we're asking through this exhibition is can we predict the future through design? Can we predict the future through the things which we're making and work out where these things are taking us next? So I'm going to um, start by looking backwards. We used to be excited about the future. Uh, in the 1960s, technology was going to save the world. It was going to save us all. Everyone would have free energy. We would have, uh, we would all be rich. We would all be wealthy. We would all be good looking, like Yuri. Uh, but instead, technology didn't really give everything to us in the end. Instead, we have this which is a sort of, um, yeah, the, the technology ran away. Uh, we no longer feel in control of technology. It's like something which is done to us. It's something which, is, which lands on top of us from above, uh, which we have no power to shape or to influence. So really this exhibition was about understanding that moment, what happened between then and now, how can we recapture some of that positivity for the future? But also, most importantly, how can we recover some of that agency, some of the ability to shape the future, some of the sense that all of us can create the future, that all of us are responsible for making the future? So we begin with this quote from the uh, recently departed French philosopher and urbanist Paul Virilio. Uh, he says, the invention of the ship was also the invention of the shipwreck. So contained within every new idea, contained within every new technology, new product, new, new, new design, is a utopia and a utopia, a positive future and a negative future. They're completely bound together. We don't get to choose one or the other, we get them both. And it's up to us to somehow navigate what these technologies become. So, of course, Today, uh, we have lots of ships. We don't have very many shipwrecks. We've somehow been able to shape that technology into something which is beneficial, where the positives outweigh the negatives. So that's our sort of attitude to the future, is can we understand the implications of the technologies that we're creating today, um, to question their inevitability, to question the sense that they will become what their creators design them to become, and to work out what role we can play in shaping them. The structure of the exhibition She underwent a, a gender transition and hadn't been and couldn't be photographed because she was in prison. So Heather, the artist, was invited to make a portrait of Chelsea just from her DNA. So she sent in uh, saliva samples, hair snippings. Those were analysed in a lab, uh, and various um, characteristics were extracted uh, from that DNA information. So hair colour, eye colour skin tone, age, gender, and so on. Um, so for us, this points towards a, a future where, the, first of all, the disciplinary boundaries break down. It's no longer um, just art, but it's art plus science plus technology, all completely interweaving. DNA, the code of life, becomes a kind of 
new, new medium of art, a new material, if you like, for making art. On the other side is something very similar, but slightly more sinister. <clears throat> so this is a commercial company called Parabon Snapshot, which uh, was inspired by these portraits. So the, the art comes first, then the company. And what they do is they work for the police. They work, they work with uh, criminal investigation agencies to create portraits of criminals. So if you have a um, sample of DNA that's discovered on the crime scene, they will make a portrait of the possible criminal and then use that poster to try and identify the criminal. Um, so, that, so this is a very interesting relationship between two projects. One, the creative project came first and the more sinister project comes second. But the, and it also somehow undermines what Heather's point with this project was, which is really to say that our identities are flexible, that our identities are not defined by our codes. And, and certainly the DNA is very um, ambiguous. I mean, I've, I've cropped the image, but you can just see that the skin color accuracy is 40%. So that's very low estimation of what that person looks like. So there's a sort of illusion of authority that is granted through this use of DNA, um, which doesn't exist in reality. The next question we ask is, we are all connected, but do we feel lonely? Uh, I've got, excuse me. I'm losing my voice, so hopefully the translator is not losing his as well, because then we're in trouble. On the left, we have a, a robot seal uh, designed to look after the elderly. So this is uh, called Paro. Uh, it's invented in Japan. As you can see, it's very cute. It uh, responds when you stroke it. It squeaks. It has big, fluffy eyes. Uh, it will kind of give you a cuddle. And I'm told it's very good at uh, alleviating anxiety. So it relaxes people, elderly people. Um, so on the one hand, fantastic idea. Uh, we have no problems so far. But then if you think more broadly about the context, which is that this is a country which is aging rapidly. Uh, there are many more old people than there are people to look after them. It's also a country which is quite uh, conservative in terms of immigration, so it's not willing to open its borders to other people, foreigners, to come and look after their elderly people. So they invent a robot. They would rather um, maintain a coherent closed society than to, uh, and, and have their uh, grandparents, their parents looked after by robots. So th this is a sort of um, peculiar suggestion of where we might be going in terms of our relationship to technology. Um, in the sense that we're already ex we already have robots in our lives, but we're, in particular we're experimenting at the very fringes of society in, se in the sense of old people with dementia. These are people who don't have a decision about how they're looked after, uh, and that's where we're experimenting with robotics. Uh, so I, I don't mean to make it sound so sinister, but I think um, we're interested in asking what are the sort of social human questions that are the consequences of the ways that we're using technology today. And on the other side is a different approach to a similar question. So uh, it's called Ein Maal, which is a Dutch for one meal, and it's a restaurant for one. So it's a restaurant uh, for people to go to just on their own. Uh, the table is more or less the same as this lectern. Um, you can fit just one set of knees underneath it. That's all. You can't have more people around the table. Uh, but it's designed for the one-third of people who live alone. Sorry, the one-third of households which are single-person households. So I was shocked by that statistic. I had no idea that so many people uh, lived alone. But it's still somehow socially unacceptable to go to a restaurant on your own. Uh, they'll ask you, oh, is anyone else coming to join you? Or other people on other tables will, will look at you sort of like your date didn't show up and they'll be sympathetic or look at you like you're quite tragic. So this is a restaurant where you, where you don't have to worry about any of those things. Uh, the, you're expected to go on your own, uh, to buy some of your free time, but also to get you out of the house if you live alone. So instead of having a microwave dinner, 
you can now have a you can now have that that those small but I think very important interactions with a waiter or interactions with somebody on another table. So both of them, and also I should say that living alone is very much more um, tended towards the elderly. So these are these are both in a way solutions to a, to a similar problem. One is technological, and one is what you might call a kind of um, social innovation. So just a quick note about the structure of the exhibition. Um, we ordered it into five sections, increasing from the scale of the individual, the scale of the home, the scale of the body, up to the scale of the planet. So we've done the individual, now we're looking to the scale of the public. And first of all, we ask the big question, does democracy still work? Uh, we've got two examples here. One on the left is uh, Antaras Mokas, who is the former mayor of Bogota, uh, Colombia. And he campaigned on a platform of being a super citizen. So he dressed up in this Lycra uniform with the big letter C on his chest and would do things like pick up rubbish or clean off graffiti, um, really set an example of what being a good citizen looks like. Uh, and he, he's, he said to his citizens, I'm, I'm just the mayor, I'm not gonna solve the city. This, Colombia is in a bad, uh, Bogota is in a bad state, remember. It's murder capital of the world, loads of traffic accidents, lots of corruption. He says, I'm not gonna fix the city for you, you have to do it yourselves. So he does other things like gives all the drivers red cards which they can use out their windows to shame other drivers when they get cut off. So there's this, you introduce not just a, a fine from the police, which the, if all the police are so corrupt then doesn't work. Uh, so I should also say he sacks all the traffic police and replaces them with mimes. So these are the sort of, you know, French ones with berets on and stripes. Uh, and they also shame the drivers and they help people cross the road and they point at you and they whack your car with a stick. So you, you create a sort of urban performance out of, the, out of traffic crossing the lights. Um, and through these sorts of, a, a couple more ones, because he's so funny and I just think that he, we should talk about him all the time. He, at Christmas time, he exchanged guns for Christmas presents for children. So uh, as a way of getting guns off the streets for... Uh, and to reduce crime. So that's nice because it stops people getting shot and children get presents. And I guess the point of all of this is just to say that um, this, is a, this is what we might call a kind of bottom-up politics, that it's something which where um, power is distributed throughout the citizens, that a good example is set, but it's not handed down from above. So this is, a, this is sort of emergent politics and now, Bogota, in particular, is a sort of urban success story. It's one of the things which is often written about. It's got new bus lines, it's got these... Um, it's, it's just one of those cities which is in, in the textbooks. And this is from only a couple of decades ago being the, the bottom of the list. On the right, we have another object of politics, which is called the Pussy Power Hat. Uh, this is an um, object of protest created in an open way. Um, a, de a designer came up with the idea. Uh, she created knitting instructions and put them on the internet. And then, and this is not part of the presentation. Uh, she put the designs on the internet and then 100,000 people knitted these hats and came and marched on Washington the day after Donald Trump was inaugurated. So I, I like to call this a kind of object of the losers. These are people who didn't win. They wanted to show their opposition to Donald Trump. They wanted to show that their, the way that Donald Trump ran his campaign was not acceptable. And somehow, this object, this hat, turned what was a series of individual protesters, of women, into a political movement, into, a, into something which you could no longer ignore, something which had mass power. So again, this is a form of politics, I think, and a form of how design can be used to shape politics. Excuse me. Up another level, if you like, uh, looking at the de design of cities and different strategies for creating uh, new public places. 
On the left, we have a bridge which is in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, it is yellow, it is for pedestrians, it is 400 meters long, and it was funded and created by the crowd. So it's a crowd-funded footbridge. Uh, instead of being built by the government or by the state, as you might normally expect, this is something which uh, citizens can, gave their own money in order to build. Um, the reason for that is that it crosses between three very distinct neighborhoods. So one divided by this highway, two on the city side, and then three on the other side of the international railway line. <clears throat> Those three districts had different responsibilities. They were sort of different councils, if you like. So this space is at the edge of all of their maps. They're concerned with the map up to the edge of the map, and they're not concerned with connecting to the next map. So it took citizens to somehow bridge those gaps. But what I really like about this project is what it's created in as a consequence of it. So it's not simply a um, bridge, but it's a sort of urban platform, if you like, a way to encourage new initiatives to grow off that connection. So this building here, which was um, left abandoned for about a decade, is now being renovated into a hotel. Uh, this place here, which was a car park, is now like the coolest night spot in Rotterdam. Um, in the bottom of this building and this building, there are now five or six stores. So again, this has become a sort of generator of new ideas and, and new uh, uh, businesses. And on the right, we have, of course, uh, Foster and Partners Apple headquarters. Um, this is a probably quite a clunky comparison, but still, this is the most refined, the most articulate architecture possible. The sort of giant iPhone. Um, the, I, I went on the construction site, they have these incredible pieces of glass, which are 14 meters long, with a custom machine to put them in place. Tiny radius, beautiful curve, no frames, just there so that people standing in the offices can look onto the trees with, with nothing impeding their vision. But they haven't even let the journalists in. The, they've been working there for a year. We haven't seen a single review in an architecture magazine of this, of this building. So, so it's a sort of fortress, of course, which I think is the opposite of a, a crowdfunded bridge. Are you, I don't even know if you're allowed to leave. <laughs> and of course, the driverless car. This is the sort of, <clears throat> I like to call this a kind of object of philosophy because we, it doesn't really exist, but we talk about it all the time and we, and we somehow apply grand theories on top of this piece of technology without any sense of whether it's going to uh, be real or not. I mean, it's a bit like some of the pictures we saw a moment ago um, for, the, for the prize. So uh, we exhibited this model, which is uh, Volkswagen's concept for a driverless car. Uh, it's called Cedric, and it is more about the interior and the relationship that you have with the, with the vehicle. But I wanted to talk about, uh, I guess, two very different um, kind of conceptual models that we have out there at the moment about the driverless car. So one of them is quite popular, which is uh, MIT's project called the Moral Machines. So this is the, and many of you will have played with this one. It's the, it's the sort of reframing of what's called the trolley problem, where, where <coughs> if there's a sort of malfunction in the car, what should it, what decision should it make? So in this example, should you swerve and kill the three passengers, save the three pedestrians, or should you go straight, kill the three pedestrians, and save the three passengers? It's a kind of impossible question to ask. But somehow, if we're going to let these cars make decisions of their own, their, th their thinking is we need to embed them with a form of ethics, a form of decision making, which is collectively agreed. So that was the process of, of running this as an open program. But for my mind, it sort of, it, it contains a, a whole lot of assumptions which I don't think are necessarily true with this new technology. So on the other side, we have a real application of the driverless car. It's currently uh, being used in Detroit. It's very slow. Uh, it's again, it's designed for elderly. It's designed to pick them up, take them to the shops, bring them home, that sort of thing, visit their friends. And because it's so slow, 
nobody's been run over yet. They never had to answer this question. So I think that's where we're going to see the application of driverless cars is simply take the speed out of it. If you don't have to hold the wheel, you can do other things. Maybe it doesn't matter if it takes a bit longer to get there. And then we have a different form of ethics around these machines. Now, this is the, my great pride for the exhibition where we were able to exhibit Facebook's drone. So this is uh, called the Aquila. Uh, it's an aircraft with a wingspan of a 747, so it's probably the length of this room, 45 meters, but three of us could lift it. It weighs 300 kilos. Incredible piece of technology. Uh, it's designed to fly in the upper atmosphere for three months at a time, solar powered, beaming the internet down to Earth. So it's what Mark Zuckerberg describes as um, a new form of infrastructure, a way to um, <coughs> connect the next billion. So uh, the whole of Africa, the whole of India can have the internet uh, thanks to these aircrafts. Hundreds of them, probably thousands of them, circling around in the sky, beaming the internet down from space. So it's not science fiction. This is something which Facebook have spent about the last five years developing. This is the working prototype which we showed in the, in the museum. Um, and for me though, it's, the, it's really the perfect ship and shipwreck. It's um, one of those objects which really could go completely either way. So if you, if you look at the positives to begin with, uh, uh, internet for everyone, that's quite good. All of the um, educational benefits, starting businesses, access to health, connection, everything that you comes with owning the internet, that's on the positives. On the negative is you have to sign up to Facebook in order to use it. So, <laughs> so with that comes what we've learned about Facebook in the last 12, year, 12 months, uh, poisonous impact on democracy, poisonous impact on our own personal anxiety, would you want to create, a, a sort of dictate that to an entire continent? So, and for me, I'm not sure about the answer. I actually think probably yes, probably it's a fair trade-off, and hopefully we can regulate Facebook more effectively. Either way, incredible piece of technology. Again, just to play this game of pairs, this is the object that we displayed next to it. So this is uh, by a much smaller company, uh, her name is Jalila Asadi. She works as a team of three. She's based in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And she's invented this project, which is called a tree antenna. So it's a coil of wire which goes around the trunk of a tree and turns it into, a, into an aerial, basically. She can transmit the internet. She has transmitted it from Russia back to the Netherlands. So it can go very long distances. And her dream is to have hundreds, if probably thousands of these trees across the earth to create a kind of parallel internet that anyone could tap into that's completely open, that's not controlled by a corporation. So, so for us, this is obviously very marginal. It's not backed by the biggest company in the world. It's not as like exciting as flying drones, but it's very simple, it's very beautiful, and it, and it poses, it reminds us that there are other alternatives, there are other futures. Next section. <coughs> is this section on the planet, so where we look at climate change and space. Again, we ask the question here, should the planet be a design project? And really what we mean by that is, if we have unintentionally designed the planet through pollution, through climate change, through the impacts that we have on the environment and so on, is it now time that we can intentionally design the planet, that we, that we should take responsibility for those changes and make some active shifts in in our relationship to it. So two projects which do that in very different ways. Uh, this project which is in Finland, it's called the Onkolo Nuclear Storage Facility. Uh, it's a nuclear storage facility which will keep nuclear waste safe for, they claim, 100,000 years. So, so it's, I think it's useful when you're looking into the future to also look backwards in, pa in parallel, a sort of symmetry. Um, 10,000 years ago we invented cities and agriculture. So wh where are we going to be in 100,000 years? This is either a very well-designed project which is going to be very stable 
or it's complete hubris and actually it's sort of quite scary. The other hand is a pigeon. This is the passenger pigeon which went extinct 100 years ago. Um, and there are many efforts now to uh, re, uh, well, return it to natural life, Jurassic Park style. So uh, the passenger pigeon occupied a very specific place in the ecosystem. Uh, it disturbed the tree canopies, which enabled other species like insects to um, be more plentiful. So if we can return the, the pigeons, we can save the bees. That's the promise. So both of these projects are, are quite, um, well, they require a sort of leap of faith. They require a um, strong hand on the, on the steering wheel in our relationship to the planet. And, and I guess that's why we ask this question. Are we brave enough to do these things? Are we brave enough to bring species back from extinction, to, to bury nuclear waste a kilometre underneath the earth for 100,000 years? Are we ready to, is that really where we've got to in our relationship to design and to the planet? From the planet, we then look outwards. We look into space. Uh, two projects, and I'll go a bit quicker now. Um, on the left is a CubeSat, which is a very small satellite, uh, 10 centimetres squared and very cheap to launch. So quite famously in American primary school, so kids of uh, 10 and 11, they, they designed, built and launched one of these satellites and they now use it for their research in the classroom. On the other side, w there's an incredible new Japanese company called ALE. And the, the product that they offer is shooting stars on demand. So you have a satellite in space, which is full of these tiny little pellets do you have this game which is called Hungry Hippos? And you tap the thing and it gets the pellets. It's like those little pellets. Except it spits them out into space and then, <coughs> and then they burn up in the atmosphere, creating a shooting star. So for your opening of your Olympic Games, for your best friend's birthday, if you're very rich, you can, on the stroke of midnight, have your own private shooting star land above your party. And, and for me, this is, and this is a real company, this is not science fiction. For me, it's, it's one of those things that just, I cannot believe. It's, it's, you know, the shooting, the stars were always out of our reach. They were always the thing which is somehow in the realm of gods. And now we can order them from our phones. Ter uh, amazing slash terrifying. Uh, our sort of final section is on the afterlife. So this is really where we collected all of the strange projects created by very rich people who want to live forever. And we asked the question, who wants to live forever? We have two versions of living forever here. On the left, this is the cryonics standby kit. So cryonics, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a very simple idea where when you die, your body is frozen, maybe just your head, depending on what you believe in, frozen and uh, defrosted in the future when we have solved death. So that's the very simple uh, crux of it. Um, of course, when you get more closer to the reality of it, it gets more complicated. So this is what, would hap what gets delivered to your house if you signed up for Cryonix. <clears throat> And th so you, you need to, of course, uh, nominate somebody, your children, your uh, family, your neighbour, your best friend, who is going to undertake this process on your body immediately after you die. So there's no time for waiting around, no time for tears, no time for saying final words. You have to put on the blue gloves, inject the medicine directly into their into their corpse and then you have to spend the next two hours progressively cooling them down while doing chest compressions and and lung activations so it took us quite a long time to work out exactly what this process is but we worked with the, with Alcor which is the sort of uh, leading um, cryonics company in America and they sent us this kit uh, and explain the process that you're, you're required to do. And after you've done that process, and they're in this coffin here, which you can see at the back, 
which is refrigerated. The company will come and collect the body and put them into their um, dry ice in their factory. And they estimate it could be anywhere between 100 and 200 years when you'll be reawoken in the future. So that's, uh, this is a real service being offered today to uh, many people. About 2,000 people around the world have signed up for it. One way to live forever. And on the other side is something which we might think of as more generous. Uh, if this is literally a preservation of the self, a preservation of your body, it's the opposite of organ donation, a selfish future, then perhaps this is a generous alternative. <coughs> it's just simply a library. Isn't the best way to live forever to write a book and to keep it and preserve it and give it to the next generation, to pass on part of your brain, part of your ideas? So the Long Now Foundation, which is set up uh, by people like Stuart Brand and Brian Eno, created what they call the Manual for Civilization. So it's a thousand books which you would want to give to the next generation. And they're preserving them, digitizing them, and they're ensuring that they can survive any form of apocalypse. And if we need to begin again, these are the books that we'll need. So there's things from encyclopedias to how to start a fire and build a tent, right up to science fiction novels and you know, uh, the periodic table. So I guess just to c finish with a little exercise here, one of the things that really underpins the work that we're doing is what's our kind of human relationship to technology? How, what are the, what's the kind of accumulative effect of all of these technologies on the way that we live, the way that we relate to each other, the way that we love each other, the way that we build our dreams? I know that sounds like very new age, but ultimately all of these pro technology is a form of kind of covert philosophy and they're shaping our brains, changing the way that we live anyway. So let's be explicit, let's understand the motives of those designers, and let's work out really what impacts are they having on our lives. So we, we ran a little experiment. We worked with a, a polling company. This is, they normally do political polling. They're called YouGov. Uh, and we got them to ask their 100,000 people across Britain, which way would you go? So the supermarket is empty. There's no queues. You can either take your shopping to the machine or to the person. So, hands up for the machine. <laughs> I'm going to take a photo, hold on. <laughs> and then I'm going to compare. Okay, hands up. Good. All right, and hands up for the human. Ooh. It's pretty close. All right, I'm going to give you the answer. In Britain, anyway. 70% of people go to the machine. So, and that's fine. I'm not going to judge those people. But it's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, to come back to an earlier point, I think this is, this is the thing that scares me the most. It scares me more than the Facebook drone. It scares me more than the artificial seal. It scares me more than the cryonics that it's those little interactions, the ones where you just say hello to somebody, you give them your money, you get the change, and probably you're exposed to somebody different. You're exposed to somebody who's not like you. They might have a different background, a different wealth, a different color. If we, if we automate all those little exchanges, the, the, the little exchanges which we think of as meaningless, then we break the fabric of society. We break the ability to relate to somebody who's different from us. So that's, the, that's my, um, this is the scariest thing in the future of technology, and it's already everywhere. But I don't want to finish on such a negative note. So as a, as a conclusion to the exhibition, we invited people to complete this sentence. The future is, and then they were able to hold up letters and finish the sentence. So the future is female, whack. The future is us. The future is people. The future is sun. Art, pinky, pact, etc. But I just wanted to leave you with this last one, which I thought was very nice. It's this woman who propped up her baby and wrote, The future is her. So thank you very much. Thank you.
you, thank you, Rory. It was, it was well, <laughs> perspective. Um, we have a Q and A session for like fifteen or ten minutes. Yeah. Um, друзья, последний сет вопросов. Uh, у нас есть десять-пятнадцать минут. Задавайте вопросы, пожалуйста, на русском языке. Mm, да, мы готовы. Вот вижу вопрос, да. Спасибо за, спасибо за лекцию. Не слышно? Сейчас, секунду. В микрофон еще раз попробуйте, пожалуйста. Да, меня слышно. Отлично. Спасибо за лекцию. Мне интересно, что уже получилось на ваших фотографиях, которые вы взяли. Сколько человек примерно? Вы могли бы примерно разделить зал? Спасибо. Oh, good question. I think it was about even. It was definitely not uh, 70-30. So we have a humanist audience tonight. <laughs> да. Еще вопросы? There's one up here. And I see that. Да, спасибо. А, вот вы говорили а, многое о будущем, да, о разных концепциях будущего. Но какая именно для вас более всего приемлемая концепция будущего, да, а, то бишь, да, существует же а, либо увеличение численности населения, да, какие-то выходные из него, либо наоборот уменьшение численности а, населения Земли, кибернетизация его. Вот для вас. А, как бы вы хотели, чтобы развивалась вся наша планета и человечество в целом? Спасибо. Okay, big question. Good. Uh, I mean, well, I, I, demog, uh, demographics and population growth is one of those things which is quite predictable because we know who's born already and how old they will last and so on. So, as, I, as far as I know, the projections are for growth which is going to slow and flatten to the end of the century. So for the next hundred years or so, until that's it, no more people, t uh, 10 billion or something like that. <clears throat> but, and that's good, but also bad, because it means this is our last chance. Whatever cities we build now, we will have forever, um, because we'll be declining. So it, for architects, for urbanists, for city makers, Now is the big challenge to build them right, to embed in them a sort of humanity that we want, because those patterns, as we know, historically, city patterns stay for a long time, hundreds, thousands of years. Those patterns will stay with us. Был вопрос там, да, там. Спасибо за выступление. Мы понимаем, что будущее наступило, но неравномерно. То есть если Китай уже в киберпанке, Америка в будущем, то Россия где-то в промышленной эре, то как догонять тем людям, которые не успевают за будущим, тем странам, которые не успевают за будущим? Uh, hopefully we can share ideas, we can support them, we can have uh, entrepreneurial pitch sessions just like we've seen here an hour ago. Um, but uh, the, the future will continue to be unevenly distributed. I, I heard a really, uh, it's sort of a good joke, but it's, maybe it's not even a joke. Uh, when I was in, um, visiting some car companies in, in Germany, And I said, come on, just tell me, like, when are we going to have driverless cars, like, honestly? And they said, five to ten years, which means we don't know. <laughs> And they say, in China, they'll have it next year. We have the technology w worked out. They can work. It's no problem. What we're, what we're not sure of is how to make them safe. And that's okay in a place like China. It's not okay in a place like Europe. So, um, and we've, we saw it already this year where Uber had their self-driving um, test vehicle and they've canceled doing self-driving. They're not going to, they'll probably have self-driving cars, but they're not going to develop it themselves because one death was too many. It was too, too much of a reputational damage for their company. So the, the future will continue to be unevenly distributed and it's perhaps more about ethics, about values and about politics 
than it is about design or technology or innovation. Rory, sorry, I'm going to be asking in Russian. I'm here. I'm here. here. Yeah, but I'm going to be asking in Russian. Um, у меня более прикладной вопрос. Во-первых, сколько времени у вас заняло и у команды собрать все эти проекты, и каким образом это происходило? Как вы к ним обращались? Все ли охотно давали все там, доступные свои документы и раскрывали какие-то коммерческие секреты? Это первый вопрос. И второй вопрос. Какие были принципы? Потому что существуют тысячи различных разработок, которые про который про себя рассказывает. Естественно, это все не может уместиться в, в одну выставку. Как вы все-таки отбирали проекты? Спасибо. Yeah, uh, good question. So we had a team of about uh, three of us as curators. Uh, we worked on it for three years. Uh, and that's quite normal for exhibitions, but possibly doing the future is quite slow because things can change quite quickly. Um, we had to have everything decided a year before we opened. So that's the sort of time and the, and the workload. We had 120 projects, so uh, that means that I have lots of emails to write and to reply to. Um, in terms of things, our criteria, we were looking for things which, we co which could go either way, that were somehow not so clear in what they might promise or where they might take us. So that's the, we're looking for ships and shipwrecks bound together. That was the main criteria. In terms of think, I mean, I'll tell you a short uh, example of something which we didn't get. We didn't get anything from the military. They are not very willing to share uh, what they're doing and what they're working on. <clears throat> Except when we announced the show and we showed the image of the Facebook plane, I got a call from the uh, UK's uh, Ministry of Defence and they said, why are you showing Facebook's plane? We've got a really amazing drone <laughs> for surveillance. Why can't you show our plane? And of course it was too late. But um, maybe we need to rethink how we organize and announce exhibitions. I think if we were able to announce it much sooner, m more people would have got in touch with us, that kind of thing. Maybe even the military. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'll answer the question and we'll finish. Um, we started uh, our conference with very positive things. Истории, как э, технология помогает нам всех нас объединить и сделать мир невероятным, прекрасным. И двигаясь э, в ходе конференции э, в дискуссиях о технологиях, о том, как она влияет на нас, влияет на мир, является ли технология методом познания или в итоге мы становимся методом познания для технологии, мы пришли к, э, к тому, что технология раскрывает очень много вещей, которые мы до этого не могли увидеть, как э, летающий дрон Фейсбука. Это та роль технологий сейчас? Или какая у них будет дальше? И какая роль технологий в городе, в котором мы живем? Это светлая, хорошая роль? Или это вообще разговор не про хорошее, а плохое? Yeah, I think it's a super interesting question whether, whether the, the point, as I understand it, the point of technology is to reveal things to us. I think absolutely. I, I mean, we sometimes, when I say we, I should also mention my co-curator, who's, who's Mariana Pestana. Um, and, and we often um, talked about technology as a mirror, um, that actually seeing a robot or a machine do something which, which we can do so easily we opened the exhibition with a robot that was folding the laundry. So this is something which we do every day. We could probably do it with our eyes closed. We can do it without thinking. But for a robot, it requires artificial intelligence, robotics, machine vision, at cutting edge, and it's still terrible. But, it, but it's somehow, sympath we can see ourselves in that thing. So I, I really believe that um, we are building ourselves. I, I mean, to come back to the earlier, lecture about artificial general intelligence and, and the nature of that intelligence. Yeah, we're, we're, we're somehow um, parents of technology as children, but perhaps as with all parents and children, it's what they, it's how they change you. It's what they um, do to you and reflect back to you. So I think that's the, the that actually the, 
the human consequences of technology are more important than technology itself. And, and we need to be open to those changes. We need to uh, welcome them and accept them and be ready to change ourselves, not just ready to solve problems. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.